Okay, so um, let's have a look at a code example written in C++ of coding on RISCOS. Um, I already have loaded my source code in my favorite editor, and given it is just text file, you can use any editor of your choice. A um, few notes before we start the uh, deep dive into the source code. So the first one is, um, this particular C++ code example has been written for um, RISCOS Open uh, DDE C++ compiler, which at the moment of making this video, it's still the old uh, C++ compiler that was distributed by Acorn originally back in the 90s, which uh, basically predates AT&T Seafront release 3.1. So it's a very, very old C++ um, compiler. And therefore, the C++ that you will see in this video is not modern C++. However, we were going to have other um, videos that are about um, the C++, modern C++, which is available on RISCOS and can be used through the GNU compiler collection. Um, the second note is, um, given that um, you know, I could have just throw a bunch of um, instructions in a main function, that will have been uh, more than sufficient for this specific uh, task ahead. However, to uh, make the video a bit more interesting, I decided to uh, instead developing in actual C++, so using object-oriented programming. And in particular, we're going to use also design patterns. But before the details, let's have a look at the task ahead. So what are we going to do in this video is we're going to write a simple program that um, will loop forever. And in the loop, it will alternate printing on the screen the word tick or talk. And when doing that, it will also toggle the uh, caps lock LED on the keyboard. Now, because the um, flag set that handles that uh, has the state of the all the keyboard keys which include the caps lock led is a um, unique data within the kernel i think the best uh, design pattern to um, hold this type of information is a singleton now if you're not familiar with design pattern <laughs> i'm going to try to put it in very few words um, a singleton pattern is a software design pattern that restricts the uh, instantiation of a class uh, to a singular instance. What does that mean? It means that we can create multiple objects out of a singleton class, but they will all share the same uh, memory and therefore the same state. And that is the reason why it fits particularly the uh, purpose of this task, because obviously we're going to have um, always the same uh, state because the caps lock is... <laughs> one, so cannot have multiple state at the same time. Um, this will also make the um, video a bit more fun because we're going to have, uh, we will instantiate multiple objects and then we will have a loop that alternate between them and we will see that uh, they are always synchronized. Anyway, let's get into the uh, code. Right, so the first line, it's pretty standard. We're just loading, uh, just including IO stream which is a standard um, C++ library, even nowadays. Um, second line is also fairly standard if you're familiar with other running system, because it's including the time.h uh, library, which allow us to um, have uh, you know, instructions that handles um, clock time on the system, both in C and in C++. Um, if you're not familiar with RISCOS, however, the interesting one to look at is uh, the include swice.h, which will include the specific RISCOS swice uh, library, which allow us to do what? To call RISCOS swice, which are uh, RISCOS uh, equivalent of the uh, syscalls on every other operating system. So this is basically the big thing. And that is the scope of this little program, teaching how to call uh, SWICE from uh, C++, basically. Okay, so um, the first thing I've done, I've defined my class, and it's a singleton class, as mentioned, so I called it caps singleton. In the uh, private section, we have an integer variable called state, 
which we will use to store the state of our object. Then we have obviously a pointer to uh, caps lock singleton, which is the pointer that we will use to instantiate all the objects uh, as a singleton, so using the exact same memory. And we call it instance PTR, which is basically uh, instance pointer. Then we have obviously the um, default constructor, and what we do in the default constructor, which we call obviously uh, singleton like the class, we just um, set state to one. So we define that our initial state is one. Okay. We will see later how we're going to use this. I could have used defaults, but um, yeah, just to put something in here, just set state one. Uh, next, in the public section, we're going to have a set of methods that will allow us to interact with this uh, class. Now, the first one is uh, get distance. Well, it's a singleton, so we need to be able to uh, retrieve uh, the um, instance pointer. How do we do that? So, if the instance pointer is not yet defined, so if it is still null, then we will uh, create a new sense of cap singleton and then assign it to instance pointer. And what we do next is we return instance pointer. Okay. If instead is um, instance pointer is not null, what we're going to do is just we're going to return instance pointer. This is how we get all the object having exactly the same memory, basically. Now the next method is print and this method allow us to do what well every time we call print depending on the, the value state okay that's how we use state depending on the value state it we can if state is equal to one we will print tick on the screen otherwise we will print talk okay the next method is toggle and what a toggle do it does sorry it toggle <laughs> the uh, state of the caps lock LED as well as the um, value in our state. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, the first thing that we need to do, we need to call a SWI and we do this using the underscore SWIX uh, function. And how underscore SWIX uh, works? Well, we pass the name of the SWI that we want to call, so the name of the syscall, and in this case, we're going to use osbyte, okay? And then we pass a function um, INR where we specify the registers, the CP registers that we're going to use to do what? To pass the swipe parameters, okay? And what we are specifying here is that we're going to use register from 0 to 2, and the parameters that follow, they will be uh, copied for us by Swikes in the corresponding uh, CPU register. Now, if you're not familiar with terminology like CPU registers and uh, these kind of things, in the video description below, there's a link to a blog article that will explain to you all these terms um, so you can follow this video very easily. Also, you will be able to get this uh, code example from the uh, RISCOS community on GitHub and please check the video description because there is a link there that will allow you to download the source code so you can play with it on your own RISCOS system. Um, also, if you're not familiar with the concept of syscalls and swives, check also the video description below because there is also there a link that to an article that will explain to you all the um, what syscalls are and on multiple platforms included RISCOS. So you will have absolutely all the information you need to have in order to follow this video very, very easily. Okay. Anyway, so now going back to our thing ahead. So SYX is going to call OSBYTE and we're going to pass these three parameters from CPU register zero. This one will go in CPU register R1, and this one will go in CPU register R2. Now, what this number 202 means is because OSBYTE 
is a SWAI that offers multiple services. And so you, by passing a number in a register register, we are calling a service, in this case, 202. And the service allow us to do two things. If we pass a zero in our one, okay, then it will let us know, so it will read for us, the uh, flag set with the state of all these special keyboard keys, which include caps lock. If we pass, however, a value different than zero, it will use this value. So it will work not in read mode, but it will work in write mode. So we use this value to execute an exclusive OR against the flag set that is stored in the kernel. And the way the EOR is going to be done is by um, using this parameters which represent a bit mask okay and so taking the flag set that is in the kernel and it against this bitmap which is going to be used basically to select certain bits out of the flag set and then exclusive or the value that we stored in r1 against that value okay so what we're doing in this case we are passing a value that corresponds to decimal 16 and this is just a way of writing basically a binary number where we are setting only one bit and in the particular case is bit number four which is the fifth bit in the binary number and that's because the bits uh, start counted from zero okay and all the other bits in the binary number are set to zero okay and what do we do that well because if we EOR this particular number against the bit set and that specific bit set, the bit number four is the bit that represents the state of the LED, what's going to happen is we're going to toggle that bit. So if that bit is zero, we will set it to one. And if it is one, we will set it to zero. Okay. And because we specify a net mask, of, uh, sorry, a bit mask of 255 and we are only playing with the um, caps lock bit, all the others will be left untouched. So in technical terms, we say they will be preserved, okay? So at the end of this syscall, what's gonna happen is that the flag set that contains the state of the caps lock LED, um, the logical state of the caps lock LED, will be changed only for the caps lock uh, LED, not for the others. And if it was a uh, logical state off, then we'll put it to on. And if it was on, we will put it to off. However, this SWI will not turn the LED on the keyboard on or off for us. To do that, we need to make another SWI, so another syscall. And in this case, it's going to be osbyte and we're going to use only register, CPU register R0, and we're going to pass in R0 the number 118. And what this is called does, it will update the state of the LED to reflect what we set up here in a logical state. So if up here we set it to 0, then here we will turn the LED off. If up here we set it to 1, then here we will turn the LED on. Okay. And what we do after that, as mentioned, we are going to toggle the value in state. And how do we do that? Well, we just multiply the value of state by minus one. So the default value is one. What's going to happen on the first call of toggle, it will become minus one. And if we call toggle again, okay, it will become one again. So every time we call, we call toggle, it will go one minus one. 1 minus 1, okay? And this is what we're doing top. Now, the last method in this class is get state. And this is a traditional <laughs> method that what, what it does, it just return the value that we have at that moment in time stored in state. And later, you will see how we're going to use this. All right. Next, what we do is here, we make sure that instance pointer is initialized to null. And that's because up here, that's what we check, okay? 
All right, let's get into the main program. Into the main program, what we do is, the first thing we do is we create our first instance of uh, Cap Singleton. And we're going to call it my caps lock one. And one is because later on we're going to create another instance that we're going to call my caps lock two. And that's how the fun begins. So what's happened here? What will happen here is that because get instance, sorry, uh, instance PTR is still null, then we will instantiate the object. Okay. What we do next here is a couple of tests and we check if uh, my caps lock one is working fine and we go print and that should print the word tick on the screen if everything is working correctly and that is because state will be set by the uh, the full constructor to one and then we are going to call toggle through my caps lock one and what's going to happen here is that the caps lock led on the keyboard uh, will uh, change state so if it is on will go off and if it is off will go on and at the same time state of our uh, caps lock one will change but because it's a singleton that will change the state for all the object for all the instance of caps uh, singleton okay and how do we going to how, how we're going to check that well well we, we will create another uh, instance here and then we will uh, call print down here. But before we do that, we will also print on the screen the address in memory where uh, my caps lock one is, has been instantiated. Okay. And why do we do that? Because we will uh, do the same for my caps lock two and that will show you that they are basically using the same address. Okay. So what we do next is we create my caps lock. Two. and we create it exactly the same way as we created my caps lock one now in this case if you remember the method get instance what's going to happen here is that instance ptr is not going to be null anymore okay so instead of creating a new instance what's going to happen is that it will return to us the address the pointer uh, to the address of the previous instance and that's how my caps lock two is going to be exactly a copy of my caps lock one And if after that we would instantiate another object that we may call caps lock, uh, my caps lock three or four or five or six, they will all use exactly the same memory. Okay. All right. So let's. What we do next is we test my caps lock two. And so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to print. But in this case, it will not print tick. It has to print talk if everything is working fine, right? And that's because we actually changed the unique state up here with toggle. Right? Remember? So here he has to print talk. And then we call toggle again. And so here the uh, caps lock LED will change again and the value state will change again as well. What we do next here, we're going to print on the screen the address in memory of my caps lock 2. And if everything is working correctly, then this value should be identical to the value we print before for my caps lock. Okay. All right. So here we start the famous infinite loop that I described at the beginning of this video. And what we do here is that we're going to check. So we're going to call get state using my caps lock one. And if the state is one, okay, then we're going to call my caps lock one print and then we're going to call uh, my caps lock one toggle okay so all we're going to do here we will print well tick and then here we will switch state again if instead get state is not equal to one right then we will use my caps lock two and print state and then we're going to toggle using my caps lock two okay so if these two objects are the same well everything is going to be fine right and that's why we can just use my caps lock one get state up here what we do next is we are going to create a variable start time and as clock t and we will store to it into it the 
uh, actual time, the time, the current time. And then what we're going to do is we're going to create another loop, so a nested loop, that fundamentally wait just for one second. And what we do in this loop, nothing, we just wait. And then once the second has elapsed, then we will repeat the infinite loop again. And if everything goes well, we should keep seeing on the screen tick, tock, tick, tock, tick, tock, okay? And obviously, we will see on the keyboard the caps lock LED flashing on and off, on and off, on and off. And that's it. Now, let's have a look at how we build this program. Now, I wanted, for this video, I wanted to show a little bit the usage of the uh, makefile templates that comes with uh, RISCOS Open uh, DD, which are pretty handy because they allow us to build an entire app with very little work on the makefile. Let's have a look. So this is the makefile. All we need to do when we use the um, DD templates, um, make templates, is type the names of the components that we want to build. And if we have multiple components, then we just have to type their name divided by a space. Okay. Then specify that the link type that we want is, in this case, C++. And that's because we want to build C++ code. And then we include the C app template, which is because we're building just a an application, okay, standard application. And then there is just a little twitch that I had to do because the um, version, the current version of the uh, make file templates come with a little bug, and is that when we try to do a debug build, they add a bit too many libraries to the build. And it appears that the amount of libraries they're adding just overcome the maximum line size, which should be 256 character, and that will count, will generate an error message. So by actually modifying it manually, so dbg libs, and specifying the list of these libraries that are needed for this specific uh, project only when we build the debug build, then that fixes the problem. Now, the debug build is something that we're going to have a look briefly, and that's because it's very useful, as it allows us to actually use the DD debugger, DDT, uh, to do source debugging of our code. We will have videos dedicated to this, uh, but it's in, the, in this video I wanted just to show you that you can do that. Okay? So that's it. Next, we're going to have a look at three... Um, Obey scripts that I usually use that help me to build code in, in, in an easy way. Um, you could potentially also just use the um, C++ front end that they have here and just drag caps lock uh, and that will work totally fine for this specific code because it's a single file so it works totally fine. Okay, And say so how you do it, you just take the file, you drag and drop over here, okay? And then you click run and that will build the um, executable okay and has the nice feature that we can select the debug um, also here and also enable the throwback which um, will display a window okay with a list of error that has happened if any during the build and we can click on the error and that will show um, automatically the source the pieces of source code that has generated the errors it's pretty handy um, all that I explained that can be done with the front-end um, tools can be done uh, using just OB files and a make file. So um, this is the um, OB file that I use to build uh, C++ code for the DD. Now, I call it MKDDE, and that is important because it reminds me that I'm going to use uh, the DD comp compiler collections. And on RISCOS, we need to make sure that the filer has seen such a thing before we run a compilation, otherwise it will give us an error because we cannot find it. How do we do that? Well, we go on our hard disk and DD should always uh, be installed in the root of our boot disk. So it should be here. So we click on this and just by entering this directory should be more than enough. But if you want to be double show, double click on set path 
And what this does is just set a set of uh, environment variables and um, Microsoft believes that will allow um, our scripts to find the tools that they need in order to build our code. So that's all. And that's why I call it MKDD, because it reminds me that I have to do this little action before um, running the script. Now let's have a look at the Obey script itself. It's very simple. So what uh, the script does, oh, uh, an Obey script is pretty much the equivalent of Linux bash or uh, either a Windows batch uh, script. Um, however, is not Obey is not as powerful as bash, but it's kind of like the same thing. Um, so the first line, um, we execute a command there and we use what is called an environment variable. Now, this is a very special environment variable, obey dollar dir, which is normally set by Riscos filer and is set with the address, sorry, with the with the path of where this particular file lives in. So this is the file, so it will be set with this path name. Okay. And so what we do here. Now, if you're familiar with Windows, don't get confused because on Windows, dir lists the content content of a directory. On Riscos, the command dir selects a directory. Okay. So what we do here, we select this directory and we make it our default directory, which makes things a bit easier for the build. Then what I do next, I set a WIMP slot, and this is because um, I'm going to use a very special type of obey file, which is called task obey. Okay, task obey. And I remember Riscos has file type, not file extensions. So this is why he knows that this file is a task obey. Now the task obey is fundamentally is, is a shortcut that allows us to execute an obey file within one of the facilities that I mentioned in the introductory video, which is the task windows, which will help us to run this code in multitasking. So basically what we're going to do here is we're going to run the entire compiling phase in multitasking. Okay. And in order to make sure that the task window has enough memory to run all the uh, DDA compilers that we're going to use, so the C++, C, uh, AME, AMU, which is the uh, DD uh, make file handler, and um, you know the linker as well, I usually uh, reserve four uh, megabytes of RAM, which is more than enough for this kind of stuff. Yeah? And then what we do next is we're going to call AMU, which I mentioned is the um, uh, command that will process our Riscos uh, make file. Okay. What we're going to say is build everything and then we set the throwback as mentioned before. So it, I, also this one will display the throwback windows in case of errors to us. Okay. All right. That's it for the MKDD. So very, very simple. Then I created another one that is called MKDD clean, which Basically, what it does, it just it, it does the same two things as before, but instead of calling AMU to build, it will call AMU to clean the project. And that's because um, the templates creates a bunch of directories and files and things. So uh, from time to time, I want to clean things up and make sure that the build is always from clean. And so I'm going to call AMU clean to clean everything out. Uh, everything up, sorry, and then I am going to call uh, strip depend, which is a command that is going to clean up all the uh, dynamic dependencies that normally are added down here during the build process. So literally to clean up everything. The last script is identical to the first one that we have seen. However, instead of build uh, the uh, release, what it's going to build is going to do is going to build the debug build. And we will have a look at this um, because it will allow us to run our code in the debugger and have source code debugging. OK, right. So let's run the release build. OK, so our code has been built fine and we can close this window and we have our executable here. 
Now, this executable is an AIF uh, executable. If you're not familiar with the um, AIF file format, in the video description below, you will find a link to an article that describes all the details of the AIF file format. And again, to know that it's an AIF, it's a file type. And in this case, the label for this file type is absolute. Okay. All right. So if we now double click on this, what's going to happen is it will open a window and we'll start printing all the um, messages that we have described before. So let's have a look. So first, it has printed a tick for the caps lock one, and the address in memory is this one. Then we created the my caps lock two and print talk, and that's because we called the remember toggle for this one. And the address is exactly the same. So our singleton is working fine. And as you can see, it's printing tick, talk, tick, talk, tick, talk in a, a perfect synchronous. So the two objects are always synchronized. And if we have a look now at the caps lock uh, LED on the keyboard, we will see it flashing at the same speed as it's been printed. OK, now I'm going to stop it. So I press escape and then press space. And we're back in the desktop, regular desktop. Now, what we're going to do next, and that's just the extra little bit that we're going to do for this um, video, is we're going to run a debug build. Okay. And it has succeeded. Now, what we have created is a different icon. You can see these two have different icon. And again, this is because they are two different file type. Okay. This one is called debug and has this uh, little uh, nice icon of a chip that looks like a bug, so <laughs> something. Um, and also has the extension minus D. And if we have a look at this file type, it's a debug image. Okay. What's the difference between these two? Uh, they are both AIF files, uh, except these file type will be executed automatically by the debugger. And you will see that just by double clicking on this one, it will also load the uh, debugger and everything else. And this also has all the um, debug symbols. So if we have a look at his sides, okay, this is the size of this one, and this is the size of the release one. So as you can see, much smaller. Okay, So this also has all the debug information that are required to actually have source uh, code debugging. That's a pretty cool feature because we can actually source code debugging C++ using uh, DD, DDT debugger. So let's proceed with that. Just double click on it and what's going to happen is it will open the debugger windows i'm going to just enlarge them a little bit to make them a bit more readable now this video is not about using ddt so but if you want i've brought a bunch of articles on how to use it now the next little bit that i'm going to show you is because you can see assembly code and i promise you source code debugging so let's get into how how do we get there so what we need to do is press the middle button here select single step because it has information about the source it will display it will automatically sorry select step by source code statement and all we have to do here is just press ok to step by source code statement with one here and automatically here we go we have our c++ code and we are at the main function ready to debug our c++ code in source format on ddt now before closing this video some recommendation because obviously uh, if you want to play with the debugger you will <laughs> try to follow this procedure this works only on a certain subset of the RISCOS hardware, so it doesn't work on all the RISCOS hardware available. It surely works on the old hardware, and again, have a look at my uh, blog for more information on how to make it work on RISCOS 4, uh, RISCOS 6, or RISCOS 3. 
and it also works on modern hardware like the Ionix PC, okay, or uh, RPC emulator, so RPC emu, or the Raspberry Pi one when you disable the uh, exceptions, which makes the Raspberry Pi one behave very much like a Ionix PC. However, at the moment of making this video, it doesn't work on the Raspberry Pi 2, Raspberry Pi 3, and Raspberry Pi 4 or 400. So, unfortunately, at the moment, there are some limitations. But as you can see, when you have the right machine, it works pretty well, and it can be really, really useful. Now, if you're not familiar with debuggers, what a debugger can do for you is not just help you to find bugs, but it also can help you to understand how that code works. And so if we keep this uh, step by uh, sort of statement, we can just keep pressing OK and we can see how this code is going to work. And yes, it will also allow you to look at the uh, source functions of the libraries that we're using. So it's really, really good if you want to understand how things are working in your code. It's very useful if you're not an expert and you want to understand how things are working in your code at source level. However, for this specific video, you know, I've been really, really long, so uh, thank you very much for watching.